Hello, CSSConf. How's it going? Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Epstein, and I made a CSS framework called Compass. And I work on a, a, pre a CSS preprocessor called SAS, uh, which evidently everyone here uses. Um, I have a family, that's my wife and my daughter, some guy. And uh, <clears throat> I'm an engineer at LinkedIn in Mountain View, California. And they pay me to work on open source software and help them out with their tool chains and front end architecture, things like that. So I went through this talk earlier today and it was like a little long. Maybe it'll be shorter this time. Uh, right, so this whole talk kind of started as an idea that happened when Jeremy Keith uh, wrote a blog post recently. Uh, he's a Dactio on Twitter, lots of books and stuff like that, and talks at things like this. <laughs> and uh, so, he, so he, the, the subject was like Chris Coyer was talking about abstractions and how wonderful they are, and he's like, eh, you know, abstractions, not so, not so sold, but I don't think that SAS is good because it's an abstraction. He thinks that SAS is good because it's a well-designed abstraction and that it's pretty easy to learn. And I was like, yes, <laughs> um, I'll take it. So uh, I kind of wanted to uh, take a step back and say, what makes SAS so syntactically awesome? So I want to tell you guys a little story about taste, collaboration, and responsiveness. Because it wasn't always like this. Uh, right, so back in 2009, there was a blog post by another speaker named Nathan Bohr, who said things in his blog post like, oh, it's a new syntax. I don't want to learn that. Uh, it's a terrible idea for a CSS syntax to be white space sensitive. Um, and then at the time, we had already announced that we were going to have a new syntax. And it's like, ah, oh, no one can do two syntaxes. That's code complexity. We'll crush them. And we had four loops in CSS. Why the frack would anyone need those? And so uh, we'll kind of come back to these statements a little bit later in the talk. Because the man had a good point. When I look back at SAS back in 2.0, I don't know about you guys, but this doesn't look like CSS. This doesn't look like anything that we have worked with on a daily basis. It looks like code of some kind. Um, and when I look at where we're at today with uh, SAS 3.3, this is code that's doing basically the same thing. It's actually a little bit fancier in terms of its output. Um, but, <clears throat> and this is, this is all just really, not, none of this, this is all abstract, like none of this is actually CSS that we're writing, but it feels more like CSS to me. Um, and I think it feels more like CSS to people like yourselves. Um, and, that and that speaks to the fact that people are using it more. So, um, and just to show kind of where the, the power of the language has come from, like, that's, that code used to generate CSS that looked a lot like this. There was a ton of duplication. The output was really simple, but uh, if you were used to writing handcrafted CSS, the fact that you were creating these abstractions meant that you wouldn't really be able to get the output that you were used to making. And so here we are at SAS 3.3, and like, I can output basically handcrafted output. Uh, and the, the, the way I use this API, the API that I kind of fell in love with back at SAS 2.0, is, is basically unchanged. So uh, the value of the abstraction here was, is still pretty good. Like, we we're able to eventually get the language to a point where we're able to output handcrafted quality code, but we didn't have to go and sacrifice that really good API. So how did we get here? Well, when SAS first started, it had a vision that was basically 
uh, makes CSS syntactically similar to some of these other tools that we've been using in the Ruby community, uh, specifically Ruby and Haml. And over time, I would say our, our vision has really changed for the project, and uh, we've largely discarded our Ruby roots uh, in many senses. Uh, the implementation is still in Ruby, but uh, our vision now is not necessarily to integrate well into the Ruby community. Our vision now is to make the experience of authoring style sheets truly enjoyable. So what makes writing a style sheet enjoyable? First, I would say that one of the reasons that writing SAS is something that people take to Twitter and say, oh my god, I love you, uh, is that they're able to express themselves creatively in their authoring experience. And that's not to say that you can't, you're not being creative if you're writing CSS. Obviously, as Simrai has shown us, super creative stuff can get made uh, using just the CSS. But what I mean is that the, if someone has given you, like, this is the exact output you need to create. Like, you can't be creative in that output, necessarily. Uh, and so the way you can find a, a creative outlet in your authoring is to create these abstractions and these named things and named variables. And there's a lot of creativity happening just in the authoring process. And that makes us enjoy our job, and it also removes a lot of drudgery from the maintenance of our style sheets. And no one likes doing drudgery work. Um, but there's some other things that are more my job, Nathan's job, uh, which is to make sure that people who are writing SAS have a really clear understanding of how SAS itself works. And that uh, when you need to debug something, if something's not going quite as planned, that that's a really straightforward process. And lastly, I think it's an, it's a, there's an aspect of trust that comes with building a software project uh, that is really important. And uh, we spend a lot of time thinking to ourselves about, now that we've earned your trust, how can we not lose your trust uh, as we make changes? But, we have a problem, which is that no one on the SAS core team currently writes style sheets for a living. Uh, Nathan actually never has. Nathan uh, is a back-end engineer, brilliant software developer, but has never written CSS for, uh, for a job. I did for a long time, but my career, just like Nicole's, has taken her down paths necessarily she didn't expect. My, my career path is not going down the path of doing lots of front-end work lately. Doing lots of awesome back-end stuff, really enjoying it too. So, so is that a problem though? Like, I, I contend that with the right people and the right processes and the right attitude, um, which is really an attitude that Nathan has had from the day one, uh, when I first approached him and said, I have some ideas for how we could change that. Uh, and he you know, sat down and listened to me. So, so I want to talk a little bit about our philosophy for how we approach software development, even though uh, our day-to-day -day lives are not spent uh, doing CSS itself. Um, right, so we do a lot of listening. Uh, basically, f new features are added to SAS because people come to us and tell us that they need new features. We aren't out there discovering it. We're not deciding that some new feature just needs to exist because we sat in an ivory tower and that seemed like a good idea. So um, if you find yourself writing code and you're like, I'm doing X quite often, and if SAS did Y, then X would be so much easier. We need to know that. Like, come to our issue tracker and tell us that. Um, and you might not even know what Y is. Like, you might not understand what SAS can do to make your life as a CSS author simpler, but you just have this gut sense that the way that you're doing it seems like it's annoying. So let's have that conversation. 
Uh, we do a lot of listening on Twitter. So here's an interaction that uh, the SAS, mainly, SAS issue, or SAS uh, Twitter handle had the other day. Um, I don't know if you can read it, but SAS, SAS wins. Uh, right. We also do a lot of listening to people that might otherwise be called trolls. <clears throat> Um, and firstly, I'd like to say is like, be careful who you call a troll because when you make something that's an open source project, you put it out there, especially if that thing has started to have some traction, uh, it's, not a, it's not a person to the people who are taking you to Twitter to criticize it. It's just a thing that you made and it's probably not a thing that you made, it's just a thing that exists in their mind. And so they're not out trying to attack you as a person. They're just frustrated. Maybe they want to use it, but they can't figure out how. Um, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of negativity that gets thrown in our general direction. And we try to have a really good attitude about it and not take it too personally. Uh, because every time a, tr a troll, uh, quote unquote, um, is talking, and even if they're doing it to like, get a rise out of us, there's some element of truth there. If they wouldn't be able to get a rise out of you if there wasn't a reason why they could kind of twist the knife a little bit. So, <clears throat> so take the moment to listen to them um, and don't, don't get your, your back up. Just let it flow over you. That's, that's our philosophy anyway. And uh, the other thing I'll say is we've turned a lot of people from, that used to be against SAS and actually quite vocal about not wanting to use CSS preprocessors at all, to people who I've taken to becoming net promoters for uh, technologies like that, uh, simply by listening to them and saying, hey, you've got a good point. You probably expected us to be defensive, but no, you're, you're right. We'll get thinking about how to fix that problem. Um, <clears throat> so Nathan and I take a tremendous amount of personal pride in SAS and Compass. And we basically will just never ship anything that we're not 100% satisfied at that moment with. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about minutia of things. What name to give some feature, uh, what, um, like all, how all these different edge cases might interact with each other, uh, the, the aesthetics of just how some, some piece of code might look, and, uh, and also like we spend a lot of time on error messages and things like that, trying to make sure, as Nicole was saying, like that error messages are your friends, they're meant to guide you to the solution, so we don't just say, you have an error on line 63, character 22. It's, you have this error, and by the way, you might have meant this, or we saw this, but we expected to see something else. <clears throat> um, but SAS, with all of the wonderful input we get all the time, is not a democracy. Uh, because I feel very strongly that consensus breeds mediocrity. And when you take a vote about how something should work. It's the thing that everyone can agree on. Uh, it, tends up being, it tends to be a little bit watered down. And so we're totally willing to take heat to make a decision that fits with a certain set of aesthetic values that we might have. Um, and, <clears throat> and so, we're, we're just constantly, sorry, I kind of lost my place here. Um, yeah, so anyways, we're, 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 we're fine to, to not take, to take votes on things, but we, we care very deeply about what everybody thinks. It's not like we're trying to ignore you, but not every idea is a good one. Um, and so to that point, uh, we, we actually have like a bit of a mental checklist we go down every time somebody proposes a new feature and we try to uh, really clearly explain to people as best as we can if some new feature doesn't uh, get accepted, <clears throat> at least initially, is we'll say, okay, here's the reason why uh, we think it would be a bad idea. And so we kind of run down this list of like, uh, 
Um, is there some way to do that using SAS already? Uh, what would that be? Is that, can you do it with pure CSS? Because pure CSS is pretty good sometimes. To, uh, how would that feature interact with other SAS features? We want to make sure that every new feature that we add kind of has a multiplicative effect over time with the features in, uh, that already exist. And so we want to we understand that these are all building blocks that we're adding, and you guys can assemble them into something really unique and special. Uh, we want things to be as intuitive as possible, and that's intuitive in the sense that when you see it, if you don't know what it means, you're able to figure it out, uh, even without reading the docs, hopefully. Uh, it's intuitive in terms of how it's going to behave, in terms of what output you're going to get in your CSS. Is it intuitive uh, in the sense that like, if you have a piece of code written on one line and you were to copy and paste that piece of code to another line in a slightly different context, would it behave like you expected it to? Um, a surprising number of feature requests come in where that property wouldn't end up actually being true. Uh, so does it make it harder, does the new feature make it harder to maintain a style sheet? So some, some people will have an uh, isolated use case for which this feature is perfect for, but then they forget about all these other ways that that feature might actually make your style sheet more complicated. And is there a potential for misuse? And, um, and so this one is really about a, a scale because every feature in SAS can be horribly abused. Uh, for the most part. And so the question is, does the value that something provides versus the, the possibility of people using it in a way that makes a style sheet harder to understand balance out? Um, right, so we kind of listen. Uh, we do things like, uh, so there, here's a bunch of um, features that get suggested probably several times a year, and there's another big conversation about it, and um, we, at least now we can mostly point to people, to places where we've already kind of hashed it all out, but uh, one feature is input blobbing, so that's like the ability to say like, ah, go to this directory and basically load in all these SAS files and put them in here. Uh, and that feature really breaks down when uh, you, you, you start worrying about like how the cascade is gonna work and you get these really subtle bugs when you add a new style sheet and you don't get to control the order in which the, the files would come in to your, to your style sheet. And so you end up, these people scratching their heads wondering why something broke on this other page and it's just because like Globbing picked it up and, and gave it an order that they probably didn't expect. Uh, so their strip unit function is one that comes up time and time again, which is like, just take the units off this number. I don't need those units. I'm going to use it over here without units. And we're like, hey, by the way, the unit on attached to a number, that's really meaningful information. Uh, and if you just want to throw that information away, you're probably not writing good code. So every time we just sit down with them, walk through their code, and we're like, yeah, here's all the ways that code that you've just written will break. Uh, Another uh, feature that gets requested a lot is, can, can I just add important to a mixin so that everything inside that mixin gets importanted? <laughs> um, yeah, so like basically, I, I just I think important is uh, the sign of bad CSS architecture, and I refuse to be part of the problem. Uh, so no. Uh, another one is, I, I wrote this property, and it's it, there's a mixin of that same name, just. Make that into the, into the mix-in. Like, just expand the mix-in wherever you see that property. Uh, and basically, we just, that intuition about how a style sheet should work, how, how, how you, if you look at source code, you know what's going to happen when you compile it, kind of falls away because you could import that property from a different place in your style sheet. And by just looking at your source code, you don't know something's happening right there. And so we reject that feature because you can't visually see that your property is going to change. Um, usually it's in the context of like uh, vendor prefixing. And obviously there are great tools like auto prefixer <coughs> and that will add prefixes if you don't want to use compasses mixins, if like that's the way you want it to work. That, that specific use case is actually, it's, it's a good use of that use case. 
but most of the other use cases, like we can't just say, oh, well, it's gonna only work for properties that exist in the CSS spec, because SAS doesn't know what those are. So uh, that's a feature we end up projecting. Um, another feature that gets asked for all the time is extend in a media block. Who here has ever tried to do an extend in a media block? Yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> um, or, or maybe you can. So let's talk about that one in particular for a second. Um, so this is a case of Nathan and I missing the forest for the trees uh, for about a year and a half. Because what happens is, so people want to write this code basically. They want to say, oh uh, yeah, well when I'm inside you know, a small screen sort of environment, apply these, extend these placeholder selectors with my code uh, and so that it adjusts, yeah. And, and, and every time they said that, what they'd say is, can you give me this output? This is what I want to see. And we're like, oh, see that's actually seems like a bad idea to us because what this involved was us taking a selector that was written at a certain document order and moving it to another place in the style sheet. And the cascade is pretty important to the way things end up looking. And we just felt that that was a, had a high likelihood of creating bugs that were really subtle and unlikely to be easy to debug. It also didn't really feel like extending something. It felt like mixing in something. And so I'd be like, well, just why don't you just write a mix in and have that mix in sometimes include and sometimes extend. Like, I think all the power of SAS exists for you to pull this off. Um, but about the 17,000th time <laughs> that people brought this up, uh, Nathan was basically at the point where we were ready to give in and say maybe we should just move all this stuff around or whatever. And uh, I, I had this epiphany that, well, actually, maybe we could just take a different tack. And I finally, like, light bulb moment, saw that what if we moved, we do have to do some duplication, but what if that duplication happened at the point of the place of the original sector that's being extended? Um, then it's easy to see where it got, where, where that it got added, it's, it's uh, and the cascade is unaffected. Uh, so uh, we kind of agreed recently on, one, on an issue that we're gonna add this. So after going through the effort of deprecating at, at extend and at media blocks, and then removing it from the language, and turning it into an error, uh, we've come around full circle by listening to feedback time and time again uh, to add that feature in. Uh, so that should be in whatever is our next release, probably 3.4. <clears throat> if someone had just said they wanted that output, <laughs> we probably would have gotten here a lot sooner. But sometimes the forest is in the way. So another thing that happened in the SAS 3.3 release was that we were just about ready to release, um, in fact, we even discussed the idea of it being so ready to go that we didn't even need to do release candidates. I'm like, ah, oh, well, you know, just do, do a release candidate one or two, see, just in case there's small bugs. So we released some release candidates and there, there's a new feature. You could use the uh, script selector in SAS uh, to, um, access that in, sorry, sorry, you can use the parent selector in SAS and access that inside of your script code. And it worked really good in like almost every use case except where when you started having comma selectors. So you basically have two parents or, or four parents instead of just one. <clears throat> and so the code that people were writing that needed to take that idea into account got really messy really fast. And the feedback that we got from the community was like, I don't understand what's going on here. And we talked about a lot of ideas in my, uh, in the slides when I publish later, there's a link to a blog post that Nathan wrote all about kind of this discovery process and what we're planning on doing about it. And it talks about all the different ideas that we discussed, and et cetera, and kind of what we plan to do, which is probably a bunch of functions to help manage this process. But 
we knew that it wasn't ready for prime time, and since we wouldn't want to ship anything, we didn't absolutely love, and we didn't know maybe we'd have to go through harder work to deprecate something in the future, just decided to pull the feature. That delayed our release by several months, but uh, in our opinion, that was better than releasing something half-baked. So, um, something that I've kind of learned over the years of working on SAS is that patience uh, is a virtue, and um, that our own understanding really cannot be rushed. Like, no amount of pounding your head against a desk is probably going to make you understand what it is you're making any faster. Um, as a person who's done startups most of his life, I think I finally understood what my startups were supposed to be about five years in. Um, sometimes three years in, it depends. Uh, but I think our brains just need time to figure out what it is. And you could have done a bunch of experimentation and maybe iterated to some great thing, but um, I'm not sure that that works with a language. And so for us, uh, the long release cycles that SAS has had throughout the years, which is, tend to be about every year, has been really good, uh, I think, for the trust that we've built with the community. And it's also let us uh, develop our own sense of what SAS is and what it should be. Um, and so what we tend to do is uh, a few very, really well thought out features in every release. It gives time for the community itself to adjust and to have a stable set of time to count on those features existing and um, also to develop best practices around them. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, so I think that's all the points there, cool. And so, like I said, like over the years, I think we've really learned what SAS is, what it should be, kind of our philosophy around it but I don't want to make any excuses for the fact that 2008 me thought this was fucking amazing. And I was speaking about it and blogging about it, and I loved it, and we were shipping this, and we were happy, and it, we were proud of it. Um, and, so it, it. and that's okay, people gave us feedback and we adjusted. Um, Clip here. Well, that didn't go so well. Are you certain the Oracle didn't? Maybe we did something wrong. Or didn't do something. No, what happened happened and couldn't have happened any other way. How do you know? We are still alive. All right. So, yeah, I, I love that quote. Um, and so I don't think, I don't, like, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but if you've ever done something and you look back at it and you're like, ah, oh, such crap. Why did I do that? But it's okay. Like, that's the path that you took to get where you got. And I think the, <clears throat> in some respects, actually, the, the syntax that SAS had initially, the, the really weird stuff that was going on there, um, to use another matrix reference, it, it freed our minds of the constraints of what CSS was. We were looking at this other stuff, this weird syntax with the colons in front and exclamation marks everywhere. Um, and we were able to say, you know, maybe control directives make sense here, or maybe, maybe this other feature, like inheritance and all these other stuff. We just kind of went crazy with it. And I don't know if we had had that original syntax, if we had taken a CSS syntax from the beginning. I don't think we would have gotten there. I think that that's the, the bad syntax that uh, most people don't use and never liked, was what gave us the ability to reimagine new capabilities that never would have come to our minds. So, <clears throat> one of the reasons I'm giving this talk is that we need your help. Like I said, we're not writing a bunch of style sheets, and so we don't have that daily necessity being the mother of invention going on. And so I wanna just walk through uh, some basic things that if you guys would like to get involved with SAS, or any other open source projects. Um, these are some really basic strategies that are super useful to open source projects in, in general. But specifically for us, uh, if you're interested in being involved, the easiest thing to do on GitHub is just to watch or subscribe to a project. <clears throat> and whenever a new, new issue comes in and you're like, that seems like something I would care about, 
just go in, you scroll down to the bottom of the page and click like listen or, or subscribe to this issue. You don't have to comment, um, but if you do, you'll be automatically subscribed. Um, anytime, so basically all of the user support of SAS falls on Nathan and I, and so anytime that the community can help triage common issues and, um, and help like confirm bug reports and tell people, tell us like, yeah, 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 this is happening, definitely, uh, and here's some more details about it, like I actually had to do these other things to get the issue to, to manifest. Um, that's super useful. Uh, if there's a regression, using uh, like git bisect to like find the commit that that regression happened in. This is especially useful in the alpha testing period of new releases. Um, and you, if you could tell the user like, yeah, yeah, that's a bug uh, or whatever, but this other thing that you could do right here, that'll, that'll work for you. These are all great things that you can do that would uh, take a bulk of time off of Nathan and I so that we could focus on doing the meatier stuff that uh, needs to happen. Um, we commonly seek feedback on the issue list. Anytime we're adding a new feature or have an idea, we start a new issue on the issue tracker and we are basically hoping that people will chime in and let us know what they think. Give us, give us positive feedback, give us negative feedback. Tell us that we're idiots. Uh, or let us know if we're on the right track. So those are all really super useful stuff. Um, but if you're going to do that, there are some basic community interaction guidelines that I'd uh, like to request. <clears throat> and they basically boil down to don't be a dick. Um, so uh, basically not everyone is, is gonna be as tapped into the issue, the, what's going on, the SAS development. Um, this, this might be the 17th time that someone has filed a bug saying about or asking for some feature or, and you know, they didn't search the issue tracker, shame on them, but so what? It's not a good user experience to be chastised for filing a bug, especially when there's actually a bug. Uh, so uh, a lot of times people will file bugs and like, they just don't understand something about CSS. Don't be like, lol, noob, CSS, learn. Just you know, send them a link to some great place on the W3C site or some other tutorial place and uh, help them understand what they don't understand. It's, it's okay, it takes a few extra minutes, um, but it's a community and helping each other out is super handy. Um, and every once in a while there's some entitled jerk that comes on and is like, I can't believe you guys have had this bug open for three years and I just bumped into it again and blah, 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 blah. Um, and most of the time, the right thing to do in that situation is close your browser, move on, go do something else, take a walk. Don't tell, don't like fall into the trap of pushing back against their anger. They're upset for a reason. It's okay for them to be upset. Uh, they might be entitled, they might be feeling entitled to something they're not. It's okay. Like, we're not... We don't, we don't generally like come back at them, we just basically say thanks for your input and move on. Um, so uh, just a few other things that you guys can do is help us uh, test alpha releases when we get those out. Um, and then there's just all the other great community stuff. So the SAS community is pretty vibrant. It's one of the reasons that people tend to pick SAS over other implementations and uh, or other preprocessors, I should say. Um, so, you know, blog about your experiences. If you've got some new technique, write a blog post. I know that it's really easy on Twitter to like spam out 14 tweets all in a row, but it's super ephemeral. That stuff's gone. Like, when you Google for it, you're not gonna find it. You're not gonna be able to read it all in one place. <clears throat> so, I know that the age of blogging kind of feels like it's declining, but actually blogging is really useful. And, uh, and so I would just encourage people to like, do that if you can. Um, if you have local meetups, of course, it's great to speak at them, share your experiences, not just about SAS, but about anything cool that's going on in your life. That's the way we learn as a community. Uh, please, like I said, give us great feature suggestions. 
Um, we love little polish patches, things that are like fixing tiny documentation bugs, or maybe there's a typo. Like the long tail effect of, of contributions to an open source project are what make them really great. Um, we, the sasling.com site has been rewritten recently. There's a bunch of docs on there, but I think that site could still be way better. So we you know, you guys are all web developers. Like, come help us write docs. You're the target user. How often do you get to be the target user for the site that you're working on? Uh, so that's all really awesome stuff. So that was what I had for you today. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you guys were able to learn a little bit about how SAS works, take away just about open source management in general. Um, you know, the SAS, like, I feel really indebted to the open source community in general over my life. Uh, SAS is my way of giving back. Whether or not you contribute to SAS, I hope you find some way to also give back. Thank you. <laughs>